Hey, we... did the autofocus just turn in your freaking piece? What's going on, smart people? We saw flammable here. As you might know by now, proofs are a big part of mathematics. They are everywhere. Mathematics without proofs is like mathematics without proofs. It really doesn't make too much sense, okay? And today we want to answer a few questions. What even is a proof? Why do mathematicians prove things? And how do you prove things in general? So those are the questions we are going to deal with today. And I hope you are going to enjoy this video. A while back, Skillshare actually sponsored one of my videos and they enjoyed the video so much that they offered me a second chance, a second sponsorship opportunity. So here goes, this video has been brought to you by Skillshare. Skillshare is basically just an online platform where they offer you courses, you can get yourself a premium membership and then basically you get access to all the courses there. Meaning, that's a really good deal right here. You are only going to pay once per month or annually. And after that, you can get your hands on over 20,000 courses, thousand upon thousand of courses, ranging from video editing, like using a green screen. So if you want to learn how to use a green screen, go to Skillshare and take a look at some Premiere Pro um, tutorials there or, or workshops. Or if you want to learn mathematics, first world logic, go there, try out Skillshare. And do you know what the best thing is? You can get two months, two months of premium membership on Skillshare for free using the link in the description, skillshare.com slash flammable maths or something like this. So if you really want to support the channel, go ahead and try out Skillshare. It's really worth it. I said it in the last video, I tried it out for myself and they got so much content there. You are never going to finish all of this up in your lifetime's worth. Okay, so go ahead, try to support the channel and now for the main video. At first, I would like to take a look at the pure definition of a proof in itself. And for this, I'm going to take a look at the best source there is. The man itself, Wikipedia. Wikipedia states the following. A mathematical proof is an inferential argument for a mathematical statement. In the argument, other previously established statements, such as theorems, can be used. In principle, a proof can be traced back to self-evident or assumed statements, known as axioms, along with accepted rules of inference. So this in itself sounded quite abstract, all right? But what are they actually trying to say? Well, a proof in itself is kind of something really simple, you could say. A proof is just a chain of events, you could say, a sequence of statements. And what Wikipedia basically stated is that we are starting from somewhere. Mathematicians also need a starting point. For example, take the Peano axioms. They just tell you something about the natural numbers, 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, up until 375, that's the biggest number, all hail Mohammed Ababu. Apart from that. <laughs> we can make use of those axioms to deduce other statements from that. So for example, that if we take 1 and 2, add them together, we get 3. This is still the natural numbers. This is something we have deduced from those axioms. And from this point onwards, we have proven a new statement. So with logical reasoning and rigorous axioms that we have constructed ourselves, stuff that mathematicians take for granted, we have proven something and we can use this proven thing to prove other things also. And this is basically what we do with a proof. We try to provide ourselves, the mathematicians, with the absolute truth, okay? We want to see if a statement can be true. And that's why we are doing proofs, to see if it's really true what we are saying here. Before we come to proofs in itself, I would like to start off with some simple logic, okay? So I hope you agree with me on this one. Let us all agree on some simple axioms. If we have a proposition or a statement, let's call it P. This thing can be either true or it's false, okay? 8 is an even number. This is true. 8 is an odd number. <laughs> This is false, okay? False statement, true statement. Now, I also want that this relationship is simply binary, okay? So we can't have a statement which is true and false at the same time. 
And yeah, we have implemented our first logical argument here. We can say that we have a binary relationship regarding statements. Either it's true or it's false. What you can also do with statements is you can quantize them. That sounds quite exciting. This sounds like quantum mechanics. Ooh, please give me the eigenvalues of a Möbius strip right here, okay? I know you are watching, Andrew. I love him, my boy. Okay, so what does it mean to quantize statements? Well, we, we can say that a statement is true for one thing. There does exist something that has a certain property or we can also have the case that for all statements there holds something, okay? So as a little example for this existence thing we are using this turned around E and for this for all thing we are using this turned around on the head a boy okay so for example for the existence there we could think about the statements there does exist only one prime number which is even i'm not going to prove it think about this for yourself it's the number two okay spoilers ahead right here or we could say on the for all statement we could turn this around a bit for all prime numbers greater or equal to three we have that they are odd okay this is also a statement that we have right here and this is what it means to quantize statements. Next up is a certain operation on logical arguments which is extremely important, especially when doing indirect proofs. It's the so-called negation. What it basically does is we take a sp statement P and we are going to say not P. So what mathematicians do there in logic, they are try trying to provide the reader or whatsoever or themselves with truth tables. So if we had originally that P has been true, then if we say not P, we mean that P is now false. Not P means false. And if we have the other direction, so if we have that P has been initially false, then not P means that our not P is thus true. So we basically just turn around the order of logic, so we are changing its truth value right here. Now that we've got that logic stuff out of the way, let us go ahead and talk about direct proofs. So those are the simplest structures of proofs, okay? But sometimes they are extremely hard to do. That's why mathematicians came up with other kinds of proofs. Some mathematicians I also know that only allow direct proofs and this makes their life so hard from time to time. Okay, but, but we are still going to talk about it. So an easy kind of proof is basically, well, just proving an equivalence relation, okay? Meaning for example equals to one plus one is equal to two. If you take a look at the piano axioms, two is the success of one, you use the addition and you get from the one side to the other side, coolio. But there are other kinds of direct proofs you could say. For example, implications. So here's a simple statement and then we are going to talk about implications. We have that if we add two even numbers together, it's going to spit out another even number. Okay, I hope this does make sense to you. If we turn this into a proof, we are going to write everything out nicely at first. We have a number a, for example, being of the form two times k, where k is element of natural numbers. Let's do it like this for simplification purposes. This is the pure definition of an easy number. But then we can also say, yeah, we have this other number b, let's define it also, b being equal to two times n, where n is element of the natural numbers also. Now we are going to use operations on those two numbers. Our statement said we are going to add two even numbers together. So this is going to be a plus b is indeed equal to two times k plus two times n. Now we know in the natural numbers the distributive laws hold so we can track this two to the outside. So we have two times parentheses and then n plus k providing us with the definition of an even number yet again. So what we get out on the other side is indeed an even number and this concludes our proof. So what I provided you with has been just a simple statement, okay? Add two even numbers together, get an even number out on the other side. But more formally, this relationship is known as an implication because we had one statement and this statement with a certain truth value implied another statement, meaning A and B even implied that A plus B is also even. This is what we had right here. This is the bigger structure that we had, the bigger logical structure. 
And implications are extremely useful. And most of mathematics is comprised of implications. So many things imply other things. Like I said in the beginning, proofs are just chain of events, sequences of events, sequences of statements happening. And this is a sequence of statements. P1 implied P2, for example. This is what we had right here more formally. And now we can also talk about the truth table when it comes to implications. Now this time we have to deal with two statements A and B and one statement is going to imply the other one. Meaning since we have two statements we also have two plus two cases to consider. We have that A can be true and then B can be true and we also have that A is true and B is false and then A is false, B is true and then A is false and B is false. Those are the three, uh, those are the four cases that we can possibly have. Those are the true values of our statements and now we can go through the implications and here's kind of a non-rigorous way of bringing this to you using examples. For example, something true can imply something true and this in itself is a true statement because well my dog is a dog does indeed imply that my dog is a dog so this is a true statement implying another statement so for example one is equal to one does imply if we add one on both sides that two is equal to two <laughs> gg nice implication right here true thing now what about something true implying something false. I mean this is weird and this doesn't work out. This is something that does not work out and you can probably go into some other axiomatic system when it comes to first world logic and you can probably provide this whole thing with a proof. Or you can basically negate both sides striving for a contraposition right there. Okay this is probably something you can do but we are going to take it for granted. Something true cannot imply something false. If something is true in the first case, how can you deduce something wrong from it? It, it really doesn't make any sense, okay? Now, next up is that something false implies something true. And this does seem counterintuitive. And I can provide you with a real world example. But for example, if we say that negative one is equal to one, this is obviously false. But now we can square both sides, okay? This does this does thus imply, I'm terribly sorry, this was a weird sentence, that negative one squared is equal to one squared, which is one being equal to one, which is true. So something false did imply something true. This is something that can certainly happen. And now for the last case, we have that something false can imply something false. I mean, if we have negative one being equal to one, that's clearly false. And if we add one on both sides, that means zero is equal to two. And it doesn't work out. So before we can move on, I would like to provide you with a real mathematical example. So that's the point of the video right here, okay? Let us do some other implication yet again. We have that, for example, n is an even number and this does imply that n squared is also even. Okay, let that sink in. We have a proposition there and this does imply another statement. Now, what we say is let n, if we do a proof, be even, meaning this is basically the same as saying n is of the form 2 times k, where k is element of natural numbers. Okay, for simplification purposes, just out of natural numbers instead of the positive and negative integers. Now, we go ahead and try to get to the other side of the implication, meaning we are going to square our n. n squared is thus going to be 2 times k times 2 times k. Meaning we can make use of the property that natural numbers are abelian under multiplication. So we have 2 times 2 times k times k is going to be 2 parentheses, it's associative under multiplication, 2k squared. Meaning it's of the form of an even number yet again. And this is what we wanted to prove. That's a perfectly fine proof and it worked out quite nicely. And here's one more thing I would like to add, like I said before. In schools, this stuff with the implications is all always only implicitly told. So no one tells you that this thing is an implication, they just provide you with some simple proofs. Okay, and there's one thing you really have to understand. We are dealing with an implication and here's a simple real world example that implications don't go backwards. Okay, if you eat shit, then you are a really disgusting person. But simply because you are a disgusting person doesn't mean that you eat shit, okay? 
is this clear to you? You eat shit makes you disgusting, but simply because you are disgusting doesn't mean that you eat shit, okay? Implications do not go the other way. This is why we have something called equivalences or chains of implications which are circular and trace back to the first proposition in there. For the equivalences, let us suppose that we have a chain of, let's say, n statements. So p1 does imply p2, does imply p3, does imply blah blah blah, up until it implies pn. And now those statements are all equivalent if we can close the circle off, meaning our pn does imply our p1 yet again. Meaning our pn also does imply p1, but this implies p2 and so on. Meaning overall, each and every statement in there is going to be equivalent and you can go through the truth tables yet again. But for simplification purposes, we are going to just take a look at two statements which are equivalent to each other. Okay, meaning we have p being equivalent to some q. p being equivalent to q means basically that p implies q and also Q implies P, meaning if we want to prove an equivalence, we have to prove both directions, okay? At first we have to show that P implies Q and then Q implies P. And this is extremely important. A lot of students get this wrong. They want to prove an equivalence, but what they only do is prove one side of the metal, namely one implication. And this is wrong, this is wrong. And now for a little example such that you can actually see how we can prove a simple equivalence. So when mathematicians say something is equivalent to each other, they like to say if and only if. For example, we have this statement, some k is odd if and only if the absolute value of k is odd. For simplification purposes, k is going to be out of the positive integers yet again. So 1, 3, 5, blah, blah, blah. Meaning this if and only if sometimes written as IFF, okay, this, this is way cooler, I'm using this too, tells us that we are dealing with an equivalent. So we are going to rewrite this and are going to end up with k odd is equivalent to absolute value of k is odd. And now we can go through this whole implication process once again. At first we are going to say let k be odd, meaning k is of the form 2 times n plus 1 where n is out of the positive integers. Now we can move on and try to get to the other side. What happens when we take the absolute value on both sides of our um, equal equals to of our equivalence relation? I'm terribly sorry. This does mean that the absolute value of k is equal to the absolute value of 2n plus 1. But the absolute value of 2n plus 1, since our k is defined positive, is the same as 2n plus 1. Meaning by definition this is an odd number. We have shown the first um, implication to be true. And now for the second implication. For this we are going to say let the absolute value of k be odd. Meaning if we do this more formally that means the absolute value of k is equal to 2n plus 1 where n is element of the natural numbers without with zero in this case positive integers. I'm going to stick to the terminology as them being the positive integers. Okay now <laughs> we can go on. We want to get to the other side where k is indeed odd. Well, since 2n plus 1 is out of the positive integers, that means our k in itself is positive and the absolute value of a positive quantity, that's the casework you do in the absolute values, is defined as being the argument in itself. So the, po the absolute value of k is just k in itself, providing us with what we wanted to prove, little qed square right here and then you are good to go. This has already been a lot of input right here, but bear with me for a few minutes more, okay? We are done with the direct proofs. This was just a little introduction into direct proofs. And now we are going to talk about indirect proofs. Indirect proofs can really make your life way easier. Proof by contradiction or using a contraposition. This is something that's absolutely fabulous. And what we basically do is there we are using the negation operation on a statement. And at first I would like to start off with the easiest kind of indirect proof, the contraposition. For this, we are going to take a look at some statement P implying another statement Q. 
Now, P implies Q. You can take a look at the truth table and now you can negate everything. Meaning, what is going to happen when you go through this whole truth table stuff? Maybe it's here, maybe not, I, I don't know yet, okay? You are going to notice that after negating both sides, you are going to end up with not Q implying not P. This is the only way our truth tables still keep their um, truth value true. <laughs> so, not Q implies thus not P. And if we can prove this statement, that also means that our original statement is going to be true. To really show you how powerful proof by contraposition is, we are going to go through an example yet again and do a nice little mathematical proof right here. Let us consider some n out of natural numbers or positive integers. Now, 4 to the nth power minus 1 is a prime number if, so implication, n is odd. Now, contraposition tells us that we are going to negate both sides. P implies Q becomes not Q implies not P. Meaning, not Q in this case is that n is not odd. Meaning, n is even, does imply 4 to the nth power minus 1 is not prime. This is what we have to show right here. Meaning, let us suppose that our n is indeed an even number. Meaning, it's of the form 2 times k. Now, we want to get to the other side. Let us consider 4 to the nth power minus 1. We can rewrite this using our condition, so that n is even, into 4 to the 2 k power minus 1. And now, from here on out, we can actually distribute the square to the outside. So 4 to the 2 k power is the same as 4 to the k power, but squared, and then minus 1. And now you see, this is simply the difference of two squares, meaning we can factor this out, leaving us with 4 to the k power minus 1 times 4 to the k power plus 1. And this is good, because this is not a prime number, because we were able to factorize this number into two linear factors, okay? Meaning it's not prime, meaning our original statement is thus also true. Isn't that cool? I mean, this is simply beautiful using simple logic to work around this problem in such a nice way. This is the power of indirect proofs. And now for proof by contradiction, the most famous boy out there probably. Oh. Proof by contradiction is yet again just a result of simple logic. Let us suppose we have a statement P yet again. And now we are going to assume that this statement is not true. So we are going to take a look at not P. Now, what would happen if we would arrive at a point where we have a contradiction? Meaning, not P is not true. If not P is not true, this does mean that not, not P, is going to be true overall. Let it sink in for a sec. We are going to negate our statement. Then we are going to strive for contradiction, proof by contradiction. Meaning our negated statement is thus not true. Meaning not and not, so that's a double no, okay, no no is a yes, means our original statement is bound to be true. Here is a really nice example that I like to use very often, okay? Let this one sink in for a second and then try to use proof by contradiction on that, okay? Pause the video, pause and ponder, try it out for yourself. Now, all four-sided circles are blue. This is my statement right here. All four-sided circles are blue. Or you can call them quadriliteral circles are blue. Okay, it doesn't quite matter. Or rectangular circles. <laughs> Now, proof by contradiction tells us that we are going to say, well, we are going to negate the statement. If we negate this one statement, it says that there exists, okay, we had this all quantization right there, there does exist a four-sided circle which is not blue. Wait a minute. There does exist a four-sided circle, which is not blue. But the thing is, there do not exist any four-sided circles because by definition, our, <laughs> our circles are no polygons. Meaning, this negated statement 
is false, meaning our original statement is true, meaning overall that all four-sided circles are indeed blue. And you can use any color if this wasn't clear from the context, okay, so you can also say that they are white or black or flammy, okay, I really don't care. But isn't that really, really cool? And now for a real mathematical example. Now here's one example that's really easy or nice to prove, I should rather say nice, using proof by contradiction and I don't know of any other way right now to, to do it. So, so that's, that's my most favorite way of proving this thing right here. Maybe you have never thought about this before, but think about a number, p for example, being equal to an odd number, an odd integer over an even integer. Okay, it doesn't seem weird at the moment, but you might notice that this thing is never going to be equal to something out of natural numbers. So this p is going to be an element of the rational numbers, for example. Now, to, to prove the statement that our p is not element of the positive integers, what we do, we are going to assume that our p is indeed element of the positive integers. Meaning, we can rewrite our p, which is of the form odd over even, as p being equal to 2k plus 1 over 2n, for example. Okay? Now, we want k and n to be out of the positive integers once again. I hope that's clear by now. You have to put it in your proof somewhere here, for example. Now, we, under the condition that's not equal to zero, okay, in the positive integers we don't want to have zero in normal case, we are going to multiply both sides by 2 times n. Now, what is going to happen? We are going to have 2 times n times p being equal to 2 times k plus 1. On the one side, we are going to have that, well, this is an even number by definition. 2 times some quantity out of natural numbers. We have assumed that p is also out of natural numbers. is equal to an odd number. Doesn't work in the natural numbers. I made a proof on that already. Okay, an odd number can be even at the same time, it doesn't work out. 2 is not equal to 1, it's not something that does work out. And thus we have finished the proof because we were running into a contradiction. Okay, little little uh, lighting blitz right here, blitzkrieg, okay. And yeah, thus we have proved our original statement to be true that p being of the form odd over even can never be out of natural numbers, positive integers whatsoever. This concludes the video now and I hope you did enjoy this video and I hope you did learn something. Do not forget to support the channel by taking a look at Skillshare and using the link down there in the description. I would highly appreciate it and you can support the channel in such a big way by just trying out Skillshare for yourself. Other than that, I thank you guys for watching. Buy those teachers I created, support the channel on Patreon. Up until the next video, have a green screen day, I guess. See ya. <laughs> Ciao. Bye, bye.